Hello everyone! First of all, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Arya. My name is Jordan. My name is Edgar. My name is Valencia. And my name is Carlo. So, first of all, why do we choose humbleness as our group name? We chose it because, in our opinion, humbleness is essential for us to implement daily, especially in the next five reasonings. First of all, openness to learning. Humility fosters a willingness to learn from others, including peers, teachers, and the broader community. This is crucial for personal and spiritual growth. And the second one is service orientation. A humble attitude encourages service to others, aligning with the Dominican commitment to helping those in need and spreading the gospel. Third, community building. Humility promotes collaboration and uni unity within the community allowing for respectful dialogue and mutual support among members. Fourth, spiritual growth. Recognizing <coughs> one's limitations and the need for grace is vital for deepening one's faith and understanding of God's will. And the last one is character development. Humbleness helps us develop resilience and patience, essential traits for navigating academic and personal challenges. Well, with that all out of the way, let's go to Prambanan. Good evening, everyone! And we are from group Humbleness, and now we're going to tell you guys about the history and the background of Candi Prambanan. Okay. Look, is it not far from the Buddhist Borobudur temple? The proximity of the two temples tells us that on Java, Buddhism and Hinduism live peacefully next to one another. Prambanan is a magnificent spectacle and an icon of Indonesia's cultural heritage. The temples at Prambanan were built in the 9th century and is known locally as Moronjongrat, coming from the legend of the Slender Virgin. The biggest temple is dedicated to Shiva, the destroyer, and the two smaller ones which sit on its right and left are dedicated to Brahma, the creator, and Vishnu, the sustainer. The tallest temple of Prambanan is a staggering 47 meters high. Its peak visible from far away and rises high above the ruins of the other temples. After hundreds of years of neglect, the Prambanan temple was rediscovered by C.A. Lons, a Dutchman, in 1733. Since then, this temple has been revitalized and today is widely regarded as the most beautiful and graceful Hindu temple in Indonesia. The grandeur, complexity, and, uh, in, and intricate architectural concept of Prambanan makes this a truly amazing structure. As a unique cultural and architectural marvel, Prambanan was declared a World Heritage Site in 1991 by UNESCO. You can see Prambanan in the background. You see for the inscription found in the complex mansions, the inauguration of a temple called Sifagra. The house of Sifa in business, also known as Sifalaya, the realm of Sifa, by King Lokapala in 856. However, this temple is more commonly known as Chani Prambanan, named after its location in the Prambanan subdistrict. Some believe that Prambanan may be a Japanese dialect for para Brahman, which means the God Almighty in English. Others suggest that the name refers to the many Brahmins who live in the temple to compound during its golden age. These three main temples and three Vahana temples, ten small shrines, and the two Apit or blind temples located between the main temples and Vahana temples. Four clear screen in English temples on four cardinal directions directed right in front of the four entrances to the inner zone. Four Pantok, back in English, temples on every corner of the inner zone. These 16 temples made up the inner zone. <coughs> Going down some steps will take you to the middle section where four layers of, of per para guardian temples circle the inner zone. The first layer has 44 temples, the second has 52, the third has 60, and the fourth has 68. These temples are identical small and plain shrines with stairs leading to the archway except for the ones in the corners which have two archways and two sets of stairs. So in total, Pramanan Temple comprises 240 temples, 16 temples in the inner zone surrounded by 224 Parapara temples. Now I'm going to tell you about the legend um, behind the Pramanan Temple. 
During its golden age, the prominent temple was the royal shrine and the center of Hinduism in Java. Historians believe that once upon a time, many Brahmins lived in the outer zone of Chandi Pramanan. However, less than a century after its inauguration, Mpu Sindok moved the kingdom from central Java to east Java. It seemed that it was due to the massive eruption of Mount Merapi in the 10th century. As a result, Chandi Pramanan was shattered, abandoned, and forgotten. Centuries later, inhabitants near the temple compounds were no longer Hindu or Buddhist followers. They did not know the history behind the piles of rocks near their village. Hence, a folk tale emerged, a story about fallen kingdoms, a prince with supernatural powers, and a cursed princess. This story became a famous legend of Roro Jongram. The legend of Roro Jongram began with the war between two neighboring kingdoms, Pengeng and Boko. Prabu Damar Moyo ruled the kingdom of Pengeng. On the other side, Prabu Boko ruled the Boko kingdom with the help of his loyal advisor, Pati Upolo. Prabu means king in English, while Pati means a royal advisor. To win the war, Prabu Damar Moyo sent his son, Prabu Bandu Bandowoso, who, was, who had supernatural powers to the battle of Yawa. In a ferocious battle, Bandung Banuoso slayed Prabhu Boko and won the war. The remaining army of Boko, led by Pati Gulopono, ran back to the palace and reported it to the princess, the daughter of Prabhu Boko. After he won the battle, Bandung Banuoso continued his siege by leading his army to attack Ratu Boko, the place of Boko Kingdom. There, he has met princess was mesmerized by her beauty, the princess was called Roroji Chongra, which means slender maiden. In turn with the princess, Badun Gondowoso spontaneously asked her hand in marriage. However, Roro was reluctant to marry him because he murdered her beloved father, King Boko. On the other hand, she couldn't directly turn down the proposal because Bandu Bonoso was in the upper hand. Hence, she put two conditions to the proposal. Bandu Bonoso had to dig a well called Jalatunda and build 1,000 temples in one night. With his supernatural powers, Bandu Bonoso dug up Jalatunda well with ease. When Rora Jongrang inspected it, she tricked him into descending it. Once Bandung Gondo also was at the bottom of the well, Pais Rukpolo buried him with massive rocks. However, using his natural using his superpowers, Bandung Gondo also was able to escape from the well. He was livid, but his intention to wed her curbed his anger. Hence, he agreed to continue working on the second condition. To build 1,000 temples in one night, Bandung Gondo also asked spirits under spirits to help him. Their speed in building those temples worried the princess. It seemed <coughs> they would complete the project well before the night was over. Hence, when they finished building 999 temples, Lola Jongran woke up all her maids and villagers up. She asked them to pound rice and set up a fire in the east to make it look like the sun had risen. It fooled the rooster, so they started to crow. Hearing the commotion and seeing the lights in the east, all the spirits thought that they had begun. Hence, they immediately abandoned their work and returned into their world. Even Bandung Bono also could not stop them. Since there were only 999 temples, Dora Tonggang had a legitimate excuse to refuse the marriage proposal. But when Bandung Bono also found out Dora Tonggang cheated on him, he was livid. Without God, he turned her into a statue to finish the a thousand temple tents. According to his Buddhist legend, the Dugra Mahisas statue in the north chamber of Shinto Temple in Chandi Prabanan was Dora Jongram, the first princess. Visiting Chandi Prabanan offers a pre found opportunity for cultural exchange and personal growth, especially for students. Here are some key reflections on the benefits of such a visit. 1. Cultural Application Experiencing the grandeur of Chandi Pramanan enhanced our understanding of Indonesian history and architecture. 
It allows students to appreciate the rich culture and heritage of the region, fostering respect for diverse traditions. Two, so, historical insight. The temple complex provides a tangible connection to the past, illustrating the artistic and religious influences of Hinduism in Indonesia. This context deepens our understanding of historical narratives and their relevance today. 3. Critical thinking. Engaging with the stories and symbolism behind the temples, encouraging students to think critically about culture, identity, and religion, and the interplay between history and modern society. Inspiration and creativity. The beauty and intricacy of the temple carvings can inspire creativity in art and design. Students may find new ways to express their ideas, influenced by this exposure to aesthetic excellence. Lastly, global citizenship. Understanding and appreciating different cultures fosters a sense of global responsibility. Students learn the importance of cultural preservation and the need for a respectful dialogue in an interconnected world. In summary, a visit to Chandi Prambanan enriches students' educational experiences, broadens their cultural horizons, and nurtures a sense of empathy and curiosity about the world. That's all, folks. Thank you.